Hello, good afternoon. I'm Carissa Slaughterback. I'm the Dean in the Graduate School of Public and International Affairs here at the University of Pittsburgh and joined with a really great panel today who are turning on their cameras. We'll be able to hear from them in a moment, but I wanna thank everyone who's here today. I know we have Gifia students and staff, faculty, alums, friends who are joining us today. We're so thrilled to have a wonderful turnout. Right now we're hitting, we're almost to 60 and the numbers keep popping up. So clearly there's a huge interest in this topic and what's happening across the world. We also know that we're here today in the context of very difficult and dangerous conditions in Ukraine um, with military and civilian violence happening, flow of over half a million people or more out of Ukraine into adjacent countries the testing of our international and intergovernmental institutions and impacts that are rippling across politics, technology, economics, and more. We'll hear a lot about those issues as we continue the conversation today. We're really fortunate to have faculty experts at Gisbea and also at Pitt. There have been a number of gatherings of experts for discussion, for insights, for commentary, for sharing expertise. And I know many of you have had a chance to participate in those. And we're really happy to be contributing some conversation here today and some expertise um, being brought to the table. I know folks who are on this call today are also sharing insights in their classes as well. So we're excited to be able to get some of that um, brought to a broad Broader audience. Um, we're also just super grateful that they're here and sharing their time. So today we have six members of our GISBIA faculty who are here. Please welcome Mindy Haas, our, one of our newest assistant professors at GISBIA. We also have Associate Professor Ryan Grauer, Professor Michael Kenny, who's also the, the um, Director of the Ridgeway Center for International Security Studies, Associate Dean and Associate Professor Erica Owen, Professor Phil Williams, and we're especially grateful to be joined today by Svetlana Maksimenko. Sorry. Um, she's an adjunct professor at GISBIA and also a senior lecturer in the Department of Economics here at the University of Pittsburgh. And she's a native of Ukraine. So Svetlana, we're sending our, our very best to you, to your family, to friends who are in Ukraine. Our hearts are with you. Can't imagine how difficult it is to be, to be watching this. So we really appreciate your being here, sharing your expertise. And I know you'll be able to share a bit of what you're hearing from folks on the ground in the country. So thank you, thank you for joining this conversation today. I'm excited to facilitate the conversation today. And I think most importantly, we hope this is a conversation. We hope there's disagreement, um, agreement where appropriate and lots of insights brought to the table. And I think lots of um, great takeaways for us as we continue to process all of the information that's flowing about what's happening on the ground. I'm gonna share a few questions with the group to get us started and we'll be inviting questions via the Q&A as well. And we look forward to hearing from you. So um, without further ado, I'm gonna just kick us off with a general question. And we're gonna ask each of the speaker, each of the experts um, on the panel today to share a little bit on this. So just based on your expertise, what are the issues that you're paying closest attention to? What are you finding to be the most useful sources of information and commentary as you're digging into these issues and processing what's happening? So we're gonna start out with Ryan Grauer and then we'll move to Mindy Haas. Thanks, Chris, and, and thank you for organizing this, and thank you to my fellow panelists. Um, we're going to have a good discussion. So my research focuses on the creation and use of military power, and so that is very much where I've been concentrating my energies and attention over the past several days. And the, the story is sort of bifurcated. I, on the one hand, you have really inspiring stories uh, of the resistance that the Ukrainians are putting up against Russia. Um, I, and it's peppered with remarkable videos I, of average Ukrainians doing things from carrying uh, landmines off of roads so that trucks can pass uh, to grandmothers uh, accosting Russian forces who seem to be confused about why they're, they are there. Um, but the, the analyst in me who is familiar with military operations has a more pessimistic view of what this is going to look like over the long term. Um, right now, there's sort of a perception that the Russian military is really quite weak. Um, and I, I think that there's no doubt, no disputing the fact that the Russian military isn't the behemoth that it was during the heyday of the Cold War. And it's probably not as strong as, as many Western analysts thought. 
but it is by no means weak. I, I think what we're seeing here is a mismatch between um, Putin's strategic and political goals and the operational and tactical level uh, engagements undertaken by the Russian military. Um, the Russians just don't train to conduct the kind of operation that Putin sent them on, a quick strike deep into Ukraine to encircle cities and to sort of shock the Ukrainians into, into uh, surrender. Um, when that didn't happen, the, the Russian military wasn't quite sure what to do. Um, I expect that they are probably going to default back to how they've behaved over the past several decades. And we're likely to see a lot of very brutal fighting uh, over the coming weeks and very brutal fighting that's going to be sustainable. Um, that yes, the Russians are suffering logistical problems right now, but they have the time and space to fix those in large part because of the nuclear umbrella that Putin can place over Ukraine to, to keep the West and, and NATO out. So that's what I'm, I'm looking at and what I'm thinking about. Great, thank you, Ryan. Mindy. Hi everyone, again, thank you to Carissa for organizing this expert panel and um, thank you to everyone who's attending. I see a number of my students and um, it makes me really happy to see you all. Uh, my research uh, is largely focused on US foreign policy, intelligence and covert action. So I'm sort of very interested in the role of intelligence in um, this entire operation. One of the unique aspects of what's going on here in Ukraine is how much public intelligence there is how much intelligence has been made public and disclosed to the public. Um, that's something very unique uh, with regard to a lot of crises. Um, for example, the United States uh, really was able to predict correctly sort of uh, um, artillery, ground, air, and naval forces and what those would look like and what movements they would make. Um, also, there has been a more recent sort of pivot of the intelligence community away from sort of counterterrorism back to sort of great power competition with Russia and China. And that has really allowed, um, you know, not only expertise on Russia's capabilities, but also some insight into Putin's intentions. And really one of the, the key questions that um, we're going to be asking here is how do those capabilities and intentions match up? touching on what Ryan had said, you know, uh, we can ask whether Putin's intentions are those of full-scale occupation of Ukraine. Um, is it simply regime change in Kyiv? Uh, is it just um, sort of occupation of Donetsk and Luhansk? And sort of what do each of those military objectives mean for what Putin's ultimate intentions are? Um, some of this uh, intelligence and intentions question also plays into the role of NATO in the region. Um, there's certainly been battlefield sort of assistance from NATO to give um, the Ukrainian military information. Um, but there's also sort of the larger question about NATO enlargement. What is its role in sort of creating this crisis? And um, how might it also sort of serve to give Russia an off ramp uh, for the aggression that's already um, displayed? Great. Thank you, Mindy. Um, we're going to turn to Erica with Michael on deck. Thanks. Uh, thanks, everyone, uh, for, for being here. Um, you know, like everyone, I've been really horrified by uh, this unprovoked attack, which is already having huge economic and human costs. Um, what surprised me sort of from a international political economy perspective is, you know, in the early days of the invasion, it seemed like we would only have symbolic sanctions. Um, and what we actually have now are deep coordinated sanctions that are more significant than, than I think we've ever seen. And in part that's due to Russia's like large economic size. Um, so we also have private actors uh, in addition to the sort of uh, cohesive response from, from, from many governments, we have private actors, private firms now boycotting preemptively um, Russia. So BP, Shell, um, Apple, Volvo, these are some of the countries that are divesting or curtailing their operations um, due to financial concerns and also likely reputational costs. Um, so now we see that Russia is almost completely economically cut off from the West. Um, it's having major effects there. The stock market is closed. The, the ruble has depreciated. Um, Russia is implementing capital controls. And, and we just don't know what will happen, right? Again, these are sort of unprecedented uh, in, in the degree to which they are sort of uh, comprehensive and affecting such a large economy. Um, and so for me, one thing that I'm 
sort of following is just sort of the highlight of these linkages between uh, international sec security conflict and the role of the economic side of things. Um, and so, you know, um, I think that's, that's what I would say as I'm just sort of, I saw a reference on Twitter to sort of two battlefields, one um, on the ground in Ukraine and one this sort of economic battlefield. And I thought that was sort of a, a useful way of thinking about it. Michael, and then we'll turn to Phil Williams. Great to see everyone. And thank you again, Dean Slaughterback, for organizing this. I do research on terrorism and violent non-state, other violent uh, non-state actors. So this week, I find myself thinking a lot about insurgency and counterinsurgency. Um, if, and that's a big if, the war proceeds to this stage I think the prospects for an insurgency developing in Ukraine are, are quite high. Um, to uh, one, of, one of my colleagues' points, we, we really don't know what, to what Mindy was saying a few moments ago. We don't know what exactly what Putin's intentions are. There's been some signaling about it just being regime change. But even if they just want to change the government leaders, um, it seems to me that Russia is still going to have to leave some sort of occupational force to, to keep their regime in place. And I think that this is going to provide an opportunity for Ukrainians to stage a resistance. Uh, they're currently very highly motivated with the clear goal, which is obviously to remove the Putin-led Russian invader from the country. Even if many soldiers and civilians are killed in the first phase of the war, they will still likely be able to draw on thousands of fighters if the war transitions to an insurgency. These would be a combination of local and foreign fighters. I think it's significant that this week, the Ukrainian government invited foreign fighters with military experience to help defend Ukraine. Even a few thousand fighters, really a few hundred fighters can cause a lot of havoc for a Putin-led occupational force in the Ukraine. This hypothetical insurgency would have strong support from the civilian population, at least at the beginning. Uh, fighters would be able to blend in with the local populace, rely on local civilians for food, other support. And they would also likely to continue to receive lots of weapons and other materiel from the US, NATO, the European Union, Germany's decision this week to send 1,000 anti-tank weapons and 500 Stinger surface-to-air missiles is a major development. Um, even formerly neutral countries are sending arms. The hypothetical guerrillas will also have some knowledge to fight an insurgency. Ukrainian soldiers have been trained and assisted by the CIA and special forces since Russia and next uh, the Crimea in 2014. NATO has also provided training. Ukrainian soldiers who received this training and who survived the initial phase of the war will likely lead the insurgency. Unfortunately, the prospects of winning an insurgency are far less certain. Russia has considerable counterinsurgency experience. Think of Chechnya, for example. And the Russians practice a particularly brutal form of counterinsurgency that might be called an authoritarian force model of coin. They are likely to try to co-opt some local elites and partner with local fighters. They did this uh, successfully in Chechnya. They are likely to, to terrorize the wider civilian population to increase the cost of supporting the insurgency. And for their own domestic audience, the Russians will stage manage the war and the counterinsurgency and uh, manipulate it there. So I don't know who will win, um, but it could very well be a lengthy and devastating insurgency and counterinsurgency. And I hope it doesn't come to that. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. We'll turn to Phil and then hear from Svetlana. Phil, you are muted. Right, better if I turn my uh, mic on. Okay, L let me, st I, I agree with very much what my colleagues have said, and I, I, I would echo one point that Michael made, and that, that is um, the whole Chechnya business. 
the Russians were good at this there, and this is not Afghanistan. So I, I, I'd give them a, I think they'd be much better at counterinsurgency than we might expect, right? From the, you know, so, so that's the first. The, I want to suggest though that, to go, go back to the origins, right? And I, I focus a lot on Putin. Um, NATO expansion removed the Cold War buffer zone. And you can have all the things about the legalities and whether it was wise or not and what promises were made or not made. But it ultimately is about, I think, legitimate Russian security concerns. And where the West failed was we couldn't turn Kiev into West Berlin, right? We were unwilling to deploy troops to Ukraine. But we also refused to consider turning Ukraine into Austria which was very successful in the Cold War as, as a neutral zone. So we didn't deter and we couldn't, we, we, we couldn't deter and we wouldn't reassure. So the US and EU ended up with the worst of all possible worlds. That, that's the first point I wanna make. Second is to do with the nuclear threats. I think there's been a lot of concern about these. I think what Putin is doing with this is underlining the stability and stability paradox that nuclear deterrence allows conven large-scale conventional war. So I, I think that's a factor. And to some extent, he's also playing what we used to call the madman theory, right? He's, he's, he's been very aggressive with his rhetoric. Um, and that's all about strengthening deterrence. I think for Putin, he's been in prospect theory land. And what I mean by that, we've seen the marginalizing of the pro-Russian party in Ukraine. Um, Putin had this very close friendship with Viktor Medvedchuk. So I think that was important to him. He also has his own domestic problems, particularly demographic. Russia lost a million people last year. By 2035, they could lose another 12 million. This is a decline in power. And so there's this gap between the long-term decline of Russia and Putin's aspirations. And it's a bit like Germany in 1914. You act now, because it's going to get worse. And so I think Putin's been dealing with a cost-cost calculation, not a cost gain one. And on top of that, he's an authoritarian leader. And the best thing about authoritarianism was an article by Robert Tucker in World Politics in 1965. We called the dictator and totalitarianism. And his argument was that with a dictator, you have almost inherent paranoia. And that leads to domestic terror so the purges in Stalin's time, and it leads to external aggression. So Nazi Germany. I think what you get in with Putin is a diluted version of that. So you are getting crackdown on dissidents, but you're also getting this willingness to try to do something about what he sees as long-term uh, security concerns. So you get domestic clampdown and external aggression. Um, and I think we've gone from common security in Europe to a zero sum game in the common neighborhood. And I think that's the that's big change. And I think it's linked to the resurgence of geopolitics, which I wanna come back to. Thank you. Thanks, Phil. All right, Svetlana. Oh, you are muted. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Uh, so first of all, I would like to thank you as a whole university community for standing with Ukraine. Um, uh, there are a number of events organized by the university uh, is uh, outstanding and uh, I'm just uh, impressed how uh, many uh, different divisions of the university graduate school of uh, public international affairs, uh, international uh, study center, Russia and East European study center organized multiple panels um, and discussions expert um, expert uh, experts sharing their opinions. So I'm very glad that uh, I have been invited to join um, this uh, panel. Um, so during these uh, dark days, Ukraine, which is a peaceful nation, um, is stands for what is the right. So what is uh, true, right? So it defends its land. So I'm extremely proud for the Ukrainians, for their uh, sense of unity and their ability to uh, stand for, for their land. Um, so addressing Clarissa's question, what I'm uh, following up during this day, so 
of course, uh, my mornings uh, and evenings are no longer um, similar to what, uh, what what my normal life is. So I try to get up uh, at least you know, 45 minutes earlier and follow the news. Uh, so of course, um, again, I'm uh, extremely interested of what is going on in Ukraine. So I uh, try to check uh, their most important events, but on the professional front, so being an economist with uh, you no know, interest in uh, Eastern Europe and Central Europe in uh, economic reforms, in the government actions that can uh, uh, change their uh, speed of reform and speed of growth of the particular economy. So I'm particularly interested in uh, what the international community could do in order to change their um, current um, flow of events. Uh, both from economic point of view and political point of view. Uh, so I follow their sanctions um, in particular. Uh, so I try to uh, understand what sanctions are the most uh, effective, uh, what sanctions are symbolic, uh, what uh, else their uh, international community could do in order to slow down their uh, efforts of Russian aggressors. Um, so with regard to sanctions, I'm particularly interested in their um, export and import related sanctions, and of course, in the sanctions affecting ability of uh, no Russian central bank to conduct uh, and the banking system to conduct operations. Great, thank you. Thanks, a really great base to kick this off. And I think highlighting some of the issues that will come up in further conversation. We already have a couple of questions coming in in the Q&A and I invite some others and we have 86 people who are on with us today. So a really, a really big audience and lots of interest. I'm gonna ask um, one question before I turn to a couple um, that are in the Q&A. One is just what are some of the humanitarian and human security issues that we should be paying closest attention to? And I know, you know, we we don't have explicit human security experts on on this call today, but I think a lot of the things that you all are talking about and the things that you're studying are key drivers of some of the movement of people, what we might be anticipating in the coming days and weeks. So I'd love your thoughts on just what should we be watching for um, right now, what's happening, and then what, what, what do you anticipate is gonna happen in the longer term? And are there any roles for some of the broader intergovernmental organizations to, um, to intervene for support? Anybody wanna jump in? Yeah, Michael and then Ryan. I think the biggest humanitarian crisis um, right now is going to be the flow of, of refugees. Um, it's growing by the day. The last number I saw was, what was it, o over 600,000. Um, if, if Russia intensifies the invasion, that's going to grow to millions. Uh, Eastern and Central Europe um, will, will have literally millions of Ukrainians uh, trying to, to come to, to their countries. This is going to be a major development, uh, a major shock uh, economically, uh, socially, politically for these countries. So I think the biggest human security um, concern right now, at, at least in my opinion, is going to be the, the impact of this, um, you know, really kind of incipient, but soon to be growing refugee crisis. Thank you, Ryan. I, I, I agree with, with Michael with, a, with one caveat. I, I think the, the refugee flow is something that can actually be handled to a certain extent right now um, because the Russians have not done much at all to try to close down the Western border of Ukraine. I, I think what we are on the verge of very likely is, is a much worse humanitarian crisis. Um, it's it's a matter of time before Russia refuels the massive convoy that's headed to Kiev, uh, and at which point they besiege the city. If they start using, uh, in, a, in a more robust way, the cluster munitions, thermobaric uh, rockets that they have, it, it's going to be masses of death and destruction that the West just isn't going to be able to do anything about. 
um, because they, there's not a capacity to organize something like the Berlin Airlift um, from early in the Cold War. Uh, and if the Russians besiege the city, they, the Ukrainian civilians aren't going to be able to get out. Uh, and so just to, to kind of foot stomp what, what Michael was saying, yeah, the refugee flows are, are the, the key problem right now. I, and honestly, not enough is, is being done. There's been a lot of discussion about shipping weapons into Ukraine. Um, I, I've seen much less about efforts to organize buses and ways to get Ukrainians out of the cities that are very likely to be surrounded and besieged in very short order. Yeah, Mindy. And then uh, Atlanta. Yeah, going on what um, Michael and Ryan have already mentioned, uh, I think there's the question of sort of how long will Russia um, sort of continue to distinguish between combatants and civilians? Um, to what extent will civilians be at risk? You know, as, as Ryan had said, with the, the siege of um, Kiev, if it comes to that. Also, um, the extensive sort of civilian involvement in like the territorial defense force. Um, a lot of people sort of involved in uh, some of this urban combat um, aren't necessarily the formally trained military forces and to what extent does that sort of put a lot more people at risk uh, than, than we would have expected initially. Uh, we also sort of see evidence that, that Russia may be um, less concerned about some of the, the laws of war and the requirements of international humanitarian law, especially with um, some of the bombings in Kharkiv and sort of the, the destruction to some civilian centers there. So uh, I'm not sure that that um, poses uh, good news for what will happen next. Great, Fitlana. Yes, so in light what uh, Ryan was saying, I believe that what we are seeing right now, so over 600,000 refugees, it's only the first wage, wave, right? So I, I think that uh, countries of the European country, uh, European Union and bordering country of Ukraine eventually would have to expect uh, much more people um, arriving. Uh, another um, issue that I would like to bring is that, uh, so the numbers that we have right now, so these are the numbers of refugees that crossed uh, their uh, western part, uh, western borders of Ukraine. So it's uh, countries bordering with their European Union and Moldova. Unfortunately, we do not have clear picture how many refugees cross the Belarusian border on the north, or even the Russian border. So in the, even though a lot of Ukrainians might not support Russia or Belarusia and be afraid of them as aggressors. So geographically, families that are located close to these countries, so they also close, they, they cross the borders seeking a uh, safe harbor in the northern, um, so in the north and uh, in the east part of Ukraine. And um, another issue that I would also like um, to, they had to bring the attention is that uh, it's a uh, um um, um, sex and the uh, age distribution of those who cross the border. So currently Ukraine implemented the restrictions as uh, so a male population of age 18 to 60 cannot leave the country. So uh, they are people who are crossing borders. So these are usually uh, female with uh, very, uh, so with, with young children. Uh, unfortunately, older population uh, is not uh, risking uh, leaving their uh, home and um, uh, so, so they are still remaining as uh, re remaining in Ukraine. So uh, they are, uh, if we if we would expect eventually there are further wave of uh, refugees. So I just uh, I just wonder what would happen with those who are in need, who are not able to move, uh, or who are at their age that uh, they simply do not consider uh, moving. The Thank you. I'm going to turn, there's a couple of questions um, in, in the Q&A around what's happening inside of Russia. And I think, you know, with AMS acknowledging that sympathizers in favor of Ukraine are growing in Russia, Anthony um, talked about how long will the Russian people tolerate this conflict? We saw some coverage of protests in the news, others calling for, pro for additional protests um, inside of Russia. What's your interpretation of what's happening? What do you think we'll see in, in the coming days? Anybody want to tackle that one? Michael? Yeah, please. 
happy to take a first stab and then my colleagues can can correct me. Um, great questions. I guess one thing that, that comes to my mind, Chris, is that um, Russia is not a free country. You know, th this this society is dominated by a highly authoritarian state that controls the media, controls the judiciary, uh, and controls the civilian population. Um, I've I've been encouraged by reports of protests, and I I really hope that that they grow. I mean, I, I wish the Russian people nothing but the best in in trying to express themselves and push back against this short sighted move by their by their leader. But I'm not too sanguine about the prospects of Russia developing a significant resistance to this just be, you, because I'm also reading reports of how quickly the police and security officials and, and even like co-workers, um, you know, the, the, there could be a rally around the flag effect going on. Um, many Russians get their news from TV, which is is controlled by the state. They they don't it. it they don't have access to the wide diversity of information that we have access to in the West. Um, so although I've been encouraged by the protests, um, I don't expect that, that we'll, we're going to see, a, I, I hope I'm wrong. I hope I'm wrong on that. So, and then Mindy. Okay, I, I think Michael's right. On the other hand, if you think about it, World War I led to regime change in Russia. Afghanistan played a huge part in leading to regime change in Russia. And I go back to some of the things Eric has said, these sanctions are really biting. They're having a big impact. And it, it's, it's a wild card, but it's not inconceivable that we could really see uh, things change domestically, in spite of all the constraints, in the view of an economic collapse, um, there could be a very different view towards the regime. Mindy? Uh, my comment was um, questioning to the extent that Putin is um, susceptible to domestic pressures and how much he's been able to sort of isolate himself uh, financially, politically, uh, from a number of these domestic pressures. I mean, we've seen uh, some protest movements in Russia, again, following the, the arrest of Navalny, uh, clearly not to the extent following Ukraine, following the Ukraine invasion, but, um, you know, Russia has uh, very successfully sort of evaded um, any of those domestic pressures. Furthermore, um, as, as Michael and Erica and others had mentioned, the, the sanctions here, um, to what extent are they able to really uh, affect Putin and sort of the, the upper leaders of Russia versus um, being more harmful to the population of Russia, as we saw with sort of the collapse of the ruble, to what extent is that going to, to harm the regime versus harming uh, just the normal Russian people? Anyone else? Yeah, Ryan, uh, Ryan and then Erica. So I, I, I'm going to go ahead and continue my theme of, of um, providing depressing commentary I, and point to a, a phenomenon that political scientists refer to as gambling for resurrection. And it's something that personalist dictators tend to do when they are in dangerous uh, political spaces. I, and in this case, wait, what that would look like, I, I, I would anticipate as Russian popular discontent grows, um, it's going to create ever more pressure on Putin to try to come out of this with a win. And that is where things are likely to get really uh, ugly. Right, right now, um, the Russians have largely restrained themselves um, in, in their fight against Ukraine, uh, in large part because the way that Putin is selling it is that Ukraine is part of Russia, right? Bringing the little brother back into the fold. Um, at such point, he begins to fear for his personal position. That's likely to go out the window, and he's likely to crack down even harder. So I, I, I agree with with my colleagues. Like it would be great if Russian popular pressure could exert some pressure, uh, some uh, put some constraints around Putin. I, I'm afraid what would happen in the interim. 
Thanks, Ryan. Erica. Yeah, I was just going to mention like along the lines of just what, what other folks have said, like the economic cost for uh, everyday Russians uh, is going to increase over time. Like right now there's fear that like, the banking system might not be solvent and people are queuing at ATMs. But as this goes on, they're gonna lose access to imported goods and you know the squeeze will also happen on sort of the industry side of things. So I think um, you know, Russia is headed for you know, economic collapse and that's gonna hu have huge sort of devastating consequences for, for people there. Thank you. I'm going to turn to a question from Karen Warner. Um, she notes the UN voted this morning. Um, we saw a number of countries voting against uh, a resolution to con condemn the actions of Russia. Um, they'll be reconvening later. But um, she's asking, what do you think um, will come of this UN voting on the agreement that Russia's behavior is not consistent with international norms or law? Do you think that the UN will take action as an entity against the Russian invasion? Yeah, Ryan, kick, kick us off. No, um, I, and it won't because Russia holds a, a permanent seat on the UN Security Council. They, they can veto right, whatever they like. They, there is, um, in some quarters, a, what I think is probably a fanciful idea being pushed forward by Ukraine about questioning Russia's legitimacy to assume the Soviet Union's old position. I, on the Security Council, I, I don't think that that's going to, to go anywhere. Um, but as long as Russia holds a veto, I, I don't see the UN playing a, a meaningful role in, in, in constraining the, the conflict. Michael? Yeah, I, I agree with Ryan. Um, humanitarian operations, specifically peacekeeping operations, peace enforcement operations have to go through the UN Security Council. That, that's how they're authorized. So um, Russia would obviously veto any, any such request as China likely would as well. Mm -hmm. um, now that doesn't mean that the UN General Assembly can't you know, pass resolutions that would have symbolic impact. And that's where I think the UN has an important role to play here is symbolically to, to reaffirm that this is not acceptable. If, if Russia wants to be part of the international community of states, it can't behave in this fashion towards other sovereign states uh, in Europe. Um, so this sort of symbolic political action, uh, I, think, I think it helps. I mean, I don't think it's completely meaningless, but um, looking for action much beyond that such as peacekeeping operations, sending peace enforcement soldiers. I don't think we're going to see anything like that for now. Now, that's the UN, I'm not talking about NATO. Do you want to talk about NATO? Well, there are a couple of questions if you want to talk about it in that context, but then also just asking about um, the role of organizations like NATO in sort of signaling deter or in accomplishing deterrence. So, Paul Moreau asked, did NATO or the US fail to effectively signal our resolve to stand with Ukraine or our preparedness to use economic tools, military material, et cetera, to help? Well, I think one of the things, and I'm sure my, I'm sure Phil and Ryan and, and other colleagues will, will want to elaborate, but, but since you asked me just very quickly, I think that this crisis has strengthened NATO. Um, the fact that Germany is, has now agreed to ship weapons to a non-NATO partner, they're not, they're not a member, but the Ukraine is a partner of NATO. This is a major development. Um, I'm actually really encouraged by what I see happening with NATO. I think this crisis is gonna strengthen the NATO alliance. It brings the alliance uh, back to its original purpose, which was to deter uh, Russian expansion um, in uh, Eastern Europe, Central Europe, Western Europe. Um, so I'm encouraged by what I see happening uh, with, with NATO. I'll stop there. Uh, let's go, Ryan, and then Phil. Yeah, to, to answer the question, um, was this a deterrence failure? I, I, don't, I don't think it was. Um, to, to deter uh, an adversary, you have to promise punishment that will put your adversary in a worse position than the gains that they would get by engaging in the behavior you're trying to stop. And I think what's become clear over the past uh, several weeks and certainly over the past week 
is that Putin values trying to reincorporate Ukraine uh, into Russia much more than he fears any punishments that the, the US, NATO, or anyone else can inflict upon him. I, and in that sort of imbalanced uh, set of preferences, uh, deterrence is just not possible. Um, deterrence is great when you can manage it. I, I don't see this as a deterrence failure though. No. I agree. I agree very much with Ryan. Um, there's a balance of interest issue here, right? As well as balance of power. First of all, Russia has far more at stake. And secondly, Russia has far greater conventional forces in the region. So both balances are in favor of, of Russia. And I, and I think that's, that's critical. And recognition of asymmetrical interests is really critical to avoid an escalation. If both had a lot of stake and both were willing to push, then I think the danger of escalation would be much greater. I think it's fortunate that in a sense, um, NATO did not, uh, that, that the US and NATO did not make an explicit uh, guarantee or commitment to Ukraine. Now, I think one result of this crisis is that the US needs to put US forces in frontline NATO states. And in a sense, acknowledge that there is a commitment to those states. And it's back to West Berlin, right? Where these forces, they might not be able to defend, but they act as a tripwire. And the Russians don't want to kill Americans any more than Americans want to kill Russia. And so I think that Biden was very prudent when he said, we are not getting involved in this. We don't want Americans being killed and we don't want Americans killing Russians. And I, I think that's, that's critical. We do need to do better with what's left with the other NATO members. And keep in mind that this is about, ultimately, I really think it, it is about in part, Ukraine potentially becoming a NATO member. And this is preemptive action on Putin's part. And I think if you go back to, to, to 2014, you see the EU behaving very irresponsible in encouraging a coup against the existing pro-Russian government. Mindy, I see you nodding. Did you want to chime in on that one too? Uh, yeah, I agree a lot um, with what my colleagues have said. I'm wondering, you know, I've seen the argument made that, that it is somewhat the West's fault for pursuing NATO enlargement uh, so aggressively in Eastern Europe and to what extent could we have, um, you know, avoided this conflict by uh, continuing to allow this, this buffer zone um, in Eastern Europe between Russia and NATO forces. Um, you know, thinking of deterrence, uh, as Phil had said, you know, conventional deterrence would be, you know, making a very clear assurance to, to your, um, your ally or your partner state here in Ukraine. Um, but I'm wondering uh, what, what my colleagues think about sort of the opposite argument that we should have um, stepped back from, from some of those states that uh, could have been sort of the hotbed of, of aggression here. Ryan. Yeah, so um, John Mearsheimer is perhaps the, the most prominent advocate of, of this point of view. And um, I, I, I'm a former student of his, but, but I really disagree with John here. Um, I, I think that I, at this point, we should probably take Putin at his word. I, and going back to that hour plus long rant I, about a week and a half ago, um, it, it, it's pretty clear that, that Putin views the collapse of the Soviet Union as the sort of key driver of what he's doing. And he, he regards Ukraine as a, a traitorous entity. The, the vote in December 1991 that, that effectively tipped uh, the USSR into collapse um, was, a, for, was a, an unforgivable crime. I, and I think even absent uh, the George W. Bush administration's really unwise promise uh, in 2008 to bring Georgia and Ukraine into NATO, I, I think Putin probably would have ended up here anyway. 
Um, but you, what he's been doing over his two plus decades in power is rebuilding the Russian state to get it to a point where he could actually do this. Russia in the 1990s couldn't do this. Russia in 2022 is having problems, but, but it sure looks like, like it can achieve certain elements of what Putin wants to achieve. Thank you. Phil. You're muted. I think Putin is very interesting because I think he's both a defensive realist and an offensive realist at the same time. I think partly there is a genuine security concern, but in a sense, he's become, a, he's orchestrating a revisionist policy to reestablish an earlier status quo. So it's this, this, this curious mix. There's a question about NATO involvement being inevitable. My view, if NATO gets directly involved in this, in this conflict, we're in serious danger of escalation. And I think NATO needs to stay out of this, out of direct involvement, clearly and unequivocally. All right, let's hear from Michael and then I'm gonna preview, we're gonna talk about natural resources and the EU. And maybe we'll hear from Svetlana and Erica on that. We keep hearing about Russia's security interests, which are certainly valid. But what about Ukraine's security interests? Ukraine is the country that has just been invaded and is likely gonna be bombed back to the Stone Age. I, the, does the international community have no responsibility here? We're just supposed to, okay, it's power politics. Sorry, Russia. Yeah. Yeah, we understand, Putin, where you're coming from. You just want to bring back the old days and kind of wash our hands of it. Um, I just, it, and it, the other thing that strikes me is it's not just about NATO. We are currently, whether we like it or not, we are currently engaged in a global struggle, liberal democratic states versus authoritarian states. And this is the front line of that struggle. So it's not just about old Cold War geopolitics getting reinvented. Democracy globally is in a precipitous decline. The Freedom House Church, the last 16 years of decline of global democracy, including in our own country, there is a larger struggle here that I think we need to be cognizant of and, and recognize. And this is the front line of that struggle. That's how I see it. Marissa, I'm so sorry, but I, I just wanted to like chime in for one second Please, because yeah. um, that that's along the lines of what I was thinking that that there is this even like bigger picture in a sense where we have other countries looking towards territories that they might consider to be you know rightfully theirs and you know how we how we react as you know are we going to stand up and defend you know countries' right to govern themselves in whatever form they wish, including as a democracy. Um, I think that there are broader implications and um, other countries will be taking note of how the, how the West responds. Yeah, Isaac Dietrich asked, you know, do the circumstances created by the invasion create an environment in Eastern Europe now in which other non-NATO states should be concerned about conflict within their own borders, especially Moldova or the Balkans? Can, um, can I just respond a little bit yeah, to Michael? So I mean, I, I agree. I agree with him with all that, right? But I'm all I'm saying is we need to be prudent. We still live in a nuclear world, and to get into a direct shooting war in Ukraine for NATO would be a crisis that far surpasses the Cuban Missile Crisis in its intensity. Let's shift gears. We're getting a lot of really, really great questions. Um, Bobby Lee is asking about sanctions. And he says, as we all know, the whole EU relies heavily on Russia's natural resources like natural gas and some countries like Germany, half of their natural gas is from Russia. So how would those sanctions really go into effect without harming the EU itself, especially now that we're suffering of global inflation? Um, I think, you know, sort of adding to that, how are we thinking about that domestically? And then also how, how are you seeing it play out in the EU context where these, these conversations are even more immediate, where there's such reliance on these resources? Erica, Svetlana, do you want to dive in first or anyone else? 
Go ahead, Atlanta. Yes, I can start and then maybe Erica will uh, will pick up. Um, so yes, I agree with Bobby that um, uh, unfortunately sanctions in the energy sector um, are twofold, right? So uh, from the point of view of Russia, yes, they are harmful to the Russian economy. It's, uh, it, we hardly would doubt that uh, um, it's, it would come unnoticed uh, by the Russian government and um, their energy sector. Uh, but their, um, uh, one of the strengths of the Russian economy is that uh, events of 2014 allowed them to uh, prepare for sanctions quite well. So since 2014, they managed to diversify their exports and imports quite well. So surprisingly, uh, their diversification of international trade index is even better than for the United States. So they have more than I don't know, 26 top partners accounting for you know, 80% of their uh, total, tra- uh, total um, exports and imports. But on the other hand, the energy experts account for a relatively large portion of um, their exports. Uh, Moreover, um, their trade with EU also accounts for about, uh, I believe, one-fourth of their total exports revenue. So sanctions imposed by EU Um, in their uh, energy sector seem to be um, quite effective on the Russian economy. Now, about the impact on the EU. So it's absolutely correct that uh, Germany um, uh, imports about 50% of its natural gas from Russian Federation. Uh, I'm sure that it was quite challenging decision for them to close the Nord Stream. Um, they uh, they realize that they will have to diversify their uh, supplies of energy, and uh, uh, of course, green, uh, green energy matters, but quick diversification is not possible for Germany. Uh, So Czech Republic is even in a more drastic position because I believe about 75% of Czech uh, natural gas um, exports, uh, sorry, imports are coming from Russia. Uh, So it's it's even more painful decision for for countries such as um, smaller, um, closed uh, uh, European Union countries. Um, so will they be able to diversify what the first actions they're going to take? Uh, it's, um, yeah, so I think it's uh, something to watch very carefully. Uh, we do know that there are ways to diversification, but I'm not sure that they, they would be possible you know, within their very nearest future. And so their economies would definitely take a kickback from, uh, from the sanctions. Mm-hmm. Erica? Oh, I would just add briefly, uh, Svetlana covered it so well. Uh, you know, we had a discussion in my class about, you know, not just sort of the economic impact, but if some of, if, if these countries, which I think they're unlikely to do in, you know, in, in the short term, try to um, set up some sanctions that affect like energy transactions, um, some of these countries might lose their ability to like heat homes in the winter. So it's not just a matter of, of, of price, but like, their actual ability to to sort of heat homes. Um, And to your question, Carissa, about like the domestic side, um, I mean, at least in in the US, I think it's it's a real concern, especially with um, elections coming up, how long Americans will sort of stay invested in and invested in in the conflict and sort of willing to absorb potentially higher costs um, for energy and, and, you know, inflation is a major concern right now. So um, I think, that, that that is a concern and that the US government's gonna have a challenge to sort of continue to make the case that like whatever the costs for us, and it will surely be less than um, the, the Europe, you know, members of the European Union, that it that it will be worth it um, in the end. Thank you. Let's talk a little bit about China and India. Um, John Shine has a great question and asks. Um, you know, how should we think about India's response to the crisis? The U.S. seems to have been trying to build a closer relationship with India as a way to help balance China's rise and reinforce the liberal international order. Is it fair to view India's response so far as an indicator that it is not interested in partnering with the West in a rules-based order? 
obviously, as we're thinking about China, we're also thinking about implications for Taiwan and one China. So would love your love your thoughts about how this is fitting into some of those um, pre-existing um, concerns in the space. Anybody want to tackle that big question first? <laughs> yeah, Ryan, thank you. I, I just preface this by saying I, I'm far from an expert on India uh, or um, the internal workings of China, but from a, a larger strategic perspective, um, both India and China are in, in an interesting position um, because they, they both historically have really valued um, sovereignty, territorial sovereignty. I, and what Putin is doing is a, a obvious violation of, of territorial sovereignty. Um, and Putin is also engaged in some behavior that, that has to be causing some heartburn in, in Beijing and Delhi um, by unilaterally declaring uh, that he recognizes the independence uh, of breakaway regions uh, in Ukraine. Both India and China have potential breakaway regions. Uh, and if it becomes normalized that other countries can just unilaterally recognize the independence of, of those entities, um, hey, that's a problem for, for India and China. But uh, counterbalancing that, both of them are um, on the authoritarian or authoritarian curious side of the ledger. I, and so I, they're, they're sort of torn between, between the two. Um, India has historically tried to balance between the, the West and the East during the Cold War and, and the United States and Russia now. Um, I, I'm, I'm not terribly surprised by either country's actions. I, I think what will be more telling is, is what they're doing a few weeks or, or a month from now, as opposed to what they're doing right at this moment. Michael, please go ahead. I think this is a great question from John. Um, I'm disappointed in India's response. I, I would have hoped for more. Um, you know, it, it's a democratic state, but India has been struggling. Um, like many other democracies throughout the world, India has really been struggling with, um, you know, maintaining liberal democratic norms in recent years. So. From from and, and as Ryan highlights, they're very sensitive over the sovereignty issue. Um, China is is obviously not a surprise how how they're reacting. At least the U.S. got them to abstain on one of the Security Council votes, as opposed to to, to um, you know voting against it. So that was a diplomatic success. Um, but yeah, India has been a disappointment. Maybe um, we can work diplomatically with them to, to try and turn this around. Again, I, I do see this as part of a larger struggle that, that goes beyond old Cold War uh, ideologies and geopolitics. And from that perspective, I think it's very important that we keep India on our side. Let's hear from Mindy and then Phil. Um, on the on the China angle, I also wanted to flag that sort of in the in the days I think leading up to the invasion, Russia sort of made an agreement with China. I think about buying a number of its exports, um, and I don't know if this is as Svetlana mentioned, sort of in a way to diversify um, and sort of protect themselves from sanctions that may be coming from the West. But I think that um, is certainly an indication of a closer Russo China relationship and um, whether that will sort of result in balancing against the West or not, um, it is an, an indication against that happening. Yeah, that aligns with a question that Paul Moreau asked about, you know, will we see more alignment between the Russian and Chinese economies? And maybe we could throw India in that as well um, as, as things evolve over time. Um, Phil, what did you want to add on this one? To Michael, um, I think where we disagree is is I think Michael has more faith in a rules based order than I do, right? Um, and I do think I, I think you want to dismiss geopolitics a bit, and you can't. One of the biggest things in this crisis is Germany. Germany has ceased its atonement foreign policy, and is now acknowledging it's going to be a major geopolitical player again. 
with, with its defence policy. That is a fundamental change. It's something we tried to avoid throughout the Cold War, when the Cold War used to be, it was all about keeping the Soviets out, the US in, and the Germans down. That was European security, the European security framework. And so I think that's, that's one aspect. The other one on this is I think we could be in a similar situation a couple of years from now over Taiwan. And I think, you know, my sense is that the US hung Taiwan out to dry years ago. Um, and it's only a matter of time. And the lesson is that when the balance of interest is in your favor, when geographic proximity is in your favor, uh, rules, unfortunately, and sovereignty can get trampled. Sorry, Mike, but, you know, I think that's the way, that's the way it is. <laughs> yeah, Silana. You are muted. So, sorry. Um, so I also believe that um, the relationship of uh, Russia, uh, China, and India is something to watch in the nearest future, because similar to Germany, they are realizing their power. And they know that um, essentially their moves might uh, allow Russia to outweigh, uh, at least in terms of economic uh, actions and sanctions, right? They are the impact uh, of sanctions that have been imposed by their European Union and um, their United States. So the, I, I think they, they, they realize that they have this, uh, uh, you know, this tool of uh, you know, balancing or slightly shifting the power. And um, um, you know, their, their actions, I think, might be quite important in the next, you know, in the next week next months. Thank you. Michael, did you want to jump in? Yeah, just real quick. Um, if Phil is right, that in a couple of years from now, and I think he, he very, very well, maybe a couple of years from now, maybe we'll be looking at a similar situation with Taiwan. To me, that underscores the importance of this current crisis, right? Are we supposed to let Putin just roll over Ukraine and say, okay, it's your backyard, your historical ties, we recognize even though Ukraine is a sovereign democratic state, we're going to put that aside and we're going to recognize Russia's geopolitical interests. Well, what do you think the Chinese are going to take away from that? They look at Taiwan very much the way Russia looks at, the, at, at, at Ukraine. So I think we have benefited from the rules-based international order. And I don't, I don't want to see it end. Um, the U.S., more than perhaps any other country, has benefited from that. We created it. Um, I think we need to keep it going as long as we can. We're, we're getting close to time, but I want to talk about um, one, one particular institution in that international order, and that's the International Criminal Court. So we have a question from Taylor. Um, Siebel, and he's saying um, the ICC is designed to hold individuals accountable for war crimes and crimes against humanity. But there's debate, of course, about the efficacy of the court to deter bad behaviors versus the court only being able to punish after the fact. A third position is that the ICC is not able to deter or punish. Where do the panelists come down on this debate? I know we've we've thought, we've seen commentary highlighting a potential role, charges of war crimes, but what are you thinking? Mindy, please jump in. Um, yeah, I, I saw this question from Taylor and I'm glad we get to answer it. I think that the ICC is interesting insofar as like its current prosecutions have only involved African um, individuals and sort of the question to which um, its jurisdiction will extend in practice to European leaders, I think is still an open one. Although we had, um, you know, trials of European leaders after the Yugoslavian civil war, um, obviously the ICC is very much subject to sort of the extradition powers of um, states themselves. The ICC sort of doesn't have its own ability to extradite these individuals to the Hague. So um, that's also sort of a large question. Could, would Russia sort of be willing to extradite Putin um, in, in a way that would sort of bring him to the dock uh, in an effective way. Ryan. Sorry, I wanna 
and just say I, I I agree with Mindy's points and and want to sort of and as is my want I add some more depressing twists on it. Um, the the ICC has shown itself capable of prosecuting crimes, as, as Mindy said, committed by African warlords I, and um, actors in states that are weak. Um, I, I don't see any reason to think that it has the same capacity to do so when we're talking about the leader of a great power that has nuclear weapons. But setting that aside, like, let's imagine we, we live in a world where um, the ICC could exert jurisdiction and in theory, Putin could be held accountable. Well, that's actually kind of a bad thing from the perspective of the Ukrainians, because Putin knows in that world, if he loses, he is going to be punished. And so that increases the incentives again for him to bring even more military force to bear to win the war in, in Ukraine. And in that, and Phil has mentioned a couple times the, the role that nuclear weapons have played. We, we've been sort of talking about them in sort of grand strategic terms. Um, it's important to note that, that the Russians have in their military doctrine a concept that they refer to as escalate to de-escalate. And it envisions the tactical use of nuclear weapons to shock and awe the adversary into causing them to back down. Um, if Russia gets into a place where it looks like it's in danger of a military loss, I, and we're in that world where Putin could be prosecuted by the ICC for the war crimes that he is in fact directing, that could incentivize really extreme uses of force, including potentially tactical nuclear use, even against uh, fellow Slavs in Ukraine. I, and so thinking about the, the ICC, I, I, I think it has a role to play in certain spaces, but I, I don't think that it has a role to play when we're talking about the leaders of, of great powers. And if it did, it would actually probably be a bad thing. Mindy. Um, going off of Ryan's point and sort of the, the potential incentives for <laughs> bad action, um, I saw another question from John saying, is there a negotiated solution that seems viable? I think that, uh, you know, a lot of the things we're talking about is sort of how the conflict is going to sort of keep occurring. What can we do? And I think um, considering what sort of off ramps there are for, for Putin right now uh, to avoid further escalation or conflict. Um, are really interesting. You know, is this um, a question of, you know, Ukraine not joining NATO for the next 50 years? Is this a question of, um, you know, securing Russian uh, natural gas interests in Central Europe? Um, I'm, again, this sort of gets to the question, I think, of Putin's intentions and ultimate interests uh, to provide him with an, uh, an attractive negotiated package. Thank you, Phil. Yeah, I, I very much thought that a lot of the discussion with the, the criminal court is counterproductive. I agree very much with Ryan uh, on that. I think Mindy's point about off ramps is well taken. And I would have thought a quick off ramp is for Ukraine to say, we have no intention of NATO, we, 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 we will pledge some kind of neutrality. And it seems to me that's one of the best off-ramps because it gives Putin at least part of what he wants, right? And what we're seeing is a Putin doctrine that is the direct heir to the Brezhnev doctrine. Uh, and in some ways, we've got to acknowledge that as a reality. And, and much as I wouldn't like it to be a reality, Mike, I think it is. Um, you know, so it, it's, it's I, I think we, we have to take into account those realities and that Russian geopolitical dominance in the region is one of them. And I think to pretend otherwise is to make some great mistakes. Thank you, everyone. Um, we are about out of time. I want to um, give each of our panelists a chance to share a final thought. Um, maybe it's a question I didn't get to, and apologies to folks who shared questions that I that we weren't explicitly be able to answer. Maybe it's one of those. Maybe it's a thought that you wanted to particularly share. Um, Svetlana, let's start with you. We'll go backwards in order. 
Yes, uh, th thank you, Clarissa. Uh, so I, I would like to chime in on there, uh, Jan's question about the negotiated solution. And in this question, I'm 100% supporter of Mindy and Philip. I think this is the best solution at this point without the involvement of NATO and uh, other power, power states. However, their role in securing uh, their, these negotiations and the points where they're um, their uh, interests of two countries border probably would be essential. So um, I would just uh, like to pray that both parties will continue uh, the second round, uh, and I'm sure there will be probably the third and the fourth round of negotiations. Um, and you know, these baby steps are significant in uh, securing peace. Um, so, yes, yeah, so hopefully that uh, our discussion today allowed everyone to get a little bit of better picture of what is at stake, right? So how events could, um, could develop in the nearest future. And uh, you know, our role as academics abroad, right, is to, the, to deliver this information to, uh, to the large number of people and you know, help with our efforts to secure this peace. So thank you for, for organizing this panel. It's, it was really, really very inform, informative and useful. Thank you, Svetlana, for joining. Um, let's uh, jump to Phil and then Michael for, for a final thought. Thank you, Chris, and thank you again for putting together this panel. It's great to see my colleagues and listen to their wisdom. Um, what I would say is that one of the big lessons of the Cold War was that Soviets and Americans didn't fight each other. I think that was a basic factor in keeping the Cold War cold. I think that applies today. And Bernard Brody captured it beautifully when he talked about the marvelous clarity of the line between non-war and destruction. An escalation can be deliberate, but it can also be inadvertent. It can also be accidental. So three different forms of escalation. I think once you start a Soviet-American shooting war, it's not clear where it stops. And so while I applaud upholding the rule-based order, I think it's a question of prudence, how far you go in doing that, and particularly when it runs in the face of geopolitical realities and some very real risks. Right, during the Cold War, we used to ask a question in Europe, would the United St States sacrifice New York for London, Paris, or Bonn. And I think, brutal as it is, the United States will not sacrifice any of these countries for Kyiv. Thank you, Clarissa. Thank you, Phil. Michael, please jump in. Sure, no, thank you. Um, wonderful discussion, I've, I've really enjoyed it. Um, I want to thank all, all our audience, frankly, everyone for taking the time to come out and, and talk about these ideas um, and, and just encourage people to, to continue to learn about, about what's going on, to stay active, to use social media, to, to spread awareness and, and, and talk to people because this is a, a huge story. It, it's not going away. The, the future ramifications um, are, are going to be uh, enormous. And um, let me just close with, with a thought for the Ukrainian people who have just been invaded, who are dying by the hundreds every day. Um, you know, and so my, my heart goes out to them. And um, I, I hope that, uh, that Putin will turn it around. Um, well, thank you. Great. Uh, let's go, Erica. Yeah, I, I think uh, I, I couldn't say much more than what Michael said. So I'll just say that I, I learned a lot from this discussion and um, it, was, it was great to participate with you all and uh, with all the um, audience participation as well. Thank you, Mindy and then Ryan. Yeah, again, I wanted to thank uh, my fellow panelists and the audience for their wonderful engagement and questions. Um, my sort of parting thought is about um, the, the prevalence here of information and perhaps disinformation, being careful about what you're reading. 
uh, the sources um, that you're getting it from. Uh, look for you know reputable on the ground uh, reporting, whether that's the Kiev Independent um, or even sort of the the major news sources. But um, just remember, uh, even when we're sort of analyzing these larger questions. Uh, individuals, leaders, states sort of do things for a reason and thinking about what they're trying to signal um, is a really important lens on looking at um, some of these international actions. Thank you. Ryan. Um, I, I want to echo my thanks to, to my fellow panelists. I, I, I enjoyed hearing what you all had to say. It, it helps shape how I, I think about things. I, and thank you to the uh, attendees. Um, just so you, as sort of a, a final thought to, to keep on my theme, um, things are going to get worse. I, militarily, it, it is, it's going to get quite ugly. And that's going to lead to a lot of calls, understandable, to do something. And we're already seeing calls by people who should know better about things like no-fly zones, which would necessarily require the United States to shoot at and kill Russians. Um, I, and instigate a war between the U.S. and, and Russia. Um, I, I would encourage people to, to take that impulse to, to want to do something, to appeal to legislators, um, to not just pro, uh, promote the, or support uh, the provision of weapons to Ukraine, which Ukrainians certainly need, but also humanitarian aid and, and relief. I, and personally to support all of the great agencies that are doing work on the ground to help the, the Ukrainians fleeing the conflict. Um, I, and to, to raise your voice about the, the inequitable distribution of relief that's being provided. We, we see stories about um, Africans I, and black Ukrainians being held up at the border I, in the way that white Ukrainians aren't. Um, I, and so focus your energies to, to help people as much as possible. Um, don't, don't push for, for a war between the USA and Russia because there are zero winners I, in that kind of conflict. Thank you so much. Um, this is an amazing panel. I, I'll echo Erica and just saying I learned a lot and it was wonderful to be able to hear this great group of faculty experts that are part of our GIFIA community. I know that we're all gonna be watching the events um, in the coming hours and days. I know when this is over, I'll be refreshing my New York Times feed to see what has continued to develop. So certainly fluid, lots of change going on. And I think it's wonderful to be able to have experts in our own community to help interpret, um, add commentary and add some really, really important insights. And I think, you know, lots of knowledge shared today, but also some important advice as well on how to process this information, what we should be thinking about that might not be first at the top of mind. So really grateful for that. Um, I'm Really happy to have amazing Gisbea faculty colleagues. Really grateful for your time, your insight today, a great conversation, even a little disagreement, which adds, uh, makes it interesting. Um, and I think, you know, just acknowledges that this isn't settled and there are lots of perspectives that are, val are, that are valid within um, the interpretation of what's happening here. And a special thanks to the audience for really amazing questions. I wish we could have covered all of them in really great detail. And I'll just um, echo, um, again, just care and peace to all of those in Ukraine and those who are in our Ukrainian community nearby. We're thinking about you and um, wishing you the best in the coming days. Thanks, Svetlana, especially for joining us today. We appreciate it. All right, great. Well, signing off, um, have a great afternoon. Thank you.